Welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we can sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux, open source, anything else we find interesting. I am Vin, and that is one Jill Bryant together with you, watching us live on Twitch. I hope you're watching us live on Twitch. If you're not listening to us after the fact, it is brilliant. Another fantastic Wednesday, maybe for some <laughs> Linux, Yay! some other things that are going on, but... <laughs> I'm kind of dancing around on pens right now. I got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of new things in my market that I'm playing with. One being Reaper. That's right. We're coming not through Harrison Mixpaz, wow. not through On Door. <laughs> no, this skittled colored digital audio. <laughs> Definitely <session> skittles. <laughs> is what I have up and running. Just out of curiosity, I'm going to talk a bit more about that. In the, but I kind of have like a weird thing going on. It's like this is this is going from one DAW to another. Is you know you got to understand how a digital audio workstation works. Just the basic concept: you put music in, you got some plugins, and music comes out. Or in our case, speech. Walking into Reaper, I haven't played with Reaper in about two years. Uh, I have to imagine this is very similar to somebody who is very familiar with Windows installing Linux for the first time. You're like, it's an operating system. I know operating systems. I got this. I operating system all the time, practically. And you get over to Linux and like, none of this works like I expect it to. Why do I have to look up all the, I, this thing's dumb. I don't like it. That's how I would have been with Reaper or anyone moving from one dot to the other. Because even though they do the same things in the, you know, the underpinnings, man, I've had to go back and get a lot of education. How does this work like this? How does this work like that? And why is this not working? What's different and what's that? But hey, I'm there. We're here. And outside of OBS being a little bit crazy. Uh, the beginning of the show. Um, I think it's going to go pretty smooth, Jill, but you don't care about any of that. Mm -hmm. You're just focused on Disney World. Yes, <laughs> Disneyland <laughs> specifically. So, yeah. So me and uh, uh, Steve has been are going to go to Disneyland tomorrow because it's his birthday and it's our 25th anniversary this weekend. So we are going to go celebrate at Disneyland tomorrow. <laughs> what are you going to do for celebration? Places to go in the world. <laughs> uh, have a nice dinner, go on some fun rides, uh, watch the fireworks, do the usual thing we do at Disneyland. But this time, th this time uh, with lots of celebration. <laughs> lots of celebration. <laughs> I'll make sure to go over to Town Hall and get Steve's husband his uh, birthday uh, <laughs> button so he can wear it at Disneyland. And everyone will wish him a happy birthday Wait and embarrass him. Well, you. <laughs> They have well, what's the birthday button? That you you actually can go. There's there's on Main Street. There's a town hall where you can go and pick up buttons for birthdays, anniversaries that Disney provides them to to give to you. That and you can wear them around the park, and then you get recognized. <laughs> Steve, you strike me as the type of person who craves attention. So, yeah. uh, two buttons for you, my man. Two buttons for you. Oh. He just wants to go have a wonderful uh, Monte Cristo sandwich at uh, New Orleans Cafe and their wonderful mint juleps. That's what he's really looking forward to tomorrow. <laughs> Straight up alcohol. All right, Steve, that's the spirit, my man. That's the spirit. All right. Let's get into a couple of things this week. And something that we've all played around with between me and Jill is the Wacom Smackums, the tablets. Yeah. And they wrote an article so, like, hey, by the way, we like Linux. Nice. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, Wacom uh, pen and tablet devices, you know, have excellent link support and are enjoying broad adoption by artists and designers using our beloved Linux platform. And they will continue to update and maintain their drivers. They love the Linux community and their devices sell real well in the Linux community. Surprisingly, they do. Yeah. They do even yes. today because we're looking at the website right now from <laughs> the community.wacom.com. All this is going to be in our show notes. We're looking at mm -hmm. a um, person who's drawing on a large Wacom tablet. And I looked that up. I'm like, yeah. mm, you know, how much does the Cintiq Pro 32 inch cost? A little over $3,000. Yeah, yeah, there's several thousand dollars, yes. <laughs> but a lot a lot of the studios um uh are using them um and not just the creative industry and and Linux enterprise environments, but the finance in industry, banking, medical and the public sectors. 
are, you know, adopting Linux solutions with uh, pen-based workflows. So they're, they are doing really well in sales, but as a result, they're contribu contributing uh, greatly and wonderfully to open source and making drivers that work well with their devices. And, you know, thank you. Thanks to um, Wacom's partnership with Red Hat, they have been able to see Wacom device support and adoption across many Linux distributions. And the ones they, the distros they officially support are CentOS 8 Stream, Fedora Workstation 35, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8.5, and Ubuntu 20.04 LTS. And, you know, of course, their devices work in most of the Linux distros, but those are the ones that they officially support. And they recommend actually using the GNOME 3 desktop because the GNOME desktop is great for uh, pen and pens and tablets. It, it really is. Really good at that. I don't know. I'd sit back and be like, I'm looking at what they support is mm -hmm. probably whatever a distribution manufacturer ships as the default desktop. I'm looking at you, Red Hat. Um, uh, GNOME <laughs> 3. Uh, <laughs> I, I got to think back, man, because you remember when touchscreens back in the day, they were very novel little devices. You know, sometimes you would even oh, see like a CRT touchscreen, like, ooh, this is neat. This was moon yeah. technology. This was the future. <laughs> Everything's going to be, you know, t movies, television, everything promised these touchscreens. They were rare and they were also wicked expensive if you could find them. And, you know, Wacom, the Wacom tablets are not cheap, but. <laughs> You know, they're the kind of the industry standard at this point for the people who um, absolutely need them. Because, you know, these days you can get reasonably good touchscreens on like Microsoft Surface. I get a uh, Samsung S6, no. which has got, you know, even the reviews. I'm like, oh, no, this is really good with pressure sensitivity and tab. I've never. I OK, I take that back. I take that back. I took the stylus out and went eh, like that one time, clipped it back on, never used it since. But um, back in 2016, Wacom's been at this for a long time, I should say. Just like oh, yeah. right out of the gate. Uh, they, they've been doing <laughs> kernel driver con contribu ah, contributing to the kernel since like 2002. But back in mm -hmm. 2016, they set it up uh, the kernel driver so they can just like readily support any new products without patches or anything like that. So that's the type of commitment that you like to see from a company. And they made a really good point. Fantastic mm -hmm. point about deployments because you know mm. if you're setting up you know 60 70 100 100 plus workstations that windows license is going to add up quick yes you know. <laughs> absolutely so you know now more companies want to deploy the open source and free operating system <laughs> and save money <laughs> it makes sense and they even pointed out yeah. in the article like hey you can tune <laughs> linux like really good for you know single use cases multi-use cases too but if you have a task you know if you basically need to create a butter robot of a device a pc that is specialized for one thing linux is the go-to thing you know and you're never going to have yeah. to worry about like your updates are ready to and so i'm going to tell you more about windows 10 at the end of the show stay tuned i'll tell you yeah <laughs> well speaking of wacom ven do you remember using their uh, SCSI devices i still have uh, several uh, Wacom uh, uh, pen touch pads from, <laughs> from the eighties <80s laughs> the, uh, that still work well, all and the they're supported stuff. on Linux. <laughs> Hundred percent that I've ever walked yeah. by is all the Wacom stuff. I was made aware. It's like that thing's expensive. Don't touch it. Understood. That's pretty much my relationship. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is today they have they have uh, tablets for. Um, you know, for any budget, including for students, mm -hmm. like, like my students use the ones that are under a hundred dollars, you know, 60 to $70, you can start with a, a Wacom bamboo tablet. So they do have, have ones that are, you know, a, a, a price range for people who can't afford, you know, a, one of the real big expensive ones. Mm -hmm. So at least there's that. <laughs> well, it's still fantastic. I mean, yeah, they do have a like, yeah. budget cost reduced, you know, they're not necessarily, they don't have a, screens per se they're just surfaces yeah. to draw on just but, the surfaces yeah. to draw on yeah and that's a game Touch changer pads. and i i say that yeah. as a, a jackbox professional somebody trying to draw <laughs> and uh like drawful or the tko games that we play sometimes in the after show on saturday the laughable <laughs> creations now it's part of the charm is trying to draw 
with my right hand using a trackball and uh, it never works out well, but it's usually comical. It yes, is. absolutely. <laughs> so Mastodon, you know, everyone's talking about yeah. hey, Twitter. Twitter might get an mm-hmm. edit button. It could be for real. And that's cool. That's all right. We talked about uh, in the pre-show, if you're patron, go back and listen to some of my thoughts on that. But Mastodon 3.5 is out and it's going to go ahead and give you that for the low, low price of free. Now, you're going to have to wait until the Mastodon servers are all upgraded 3.5 before it's going to be showing up in your web app. Now, again, what am I talking about? The ability to edit posts. Now, don't worry, though. I was a little taken aback. I'm like, I don't know if I necessarily like that, if you're thinking about it in the same way I am. But the original and previous versions of the post, they're going to be saved. They're going to remain accessible throughout your history view. So you're going to have a record. And that's what I was kind of worried about. I'm glad to see that is there. Also, here's a free bonus soda. Media attachments no longer dependent on the order they were uploaded. Nice. Yeah. I like yeah, to see that's that. the thing. Yeah. <laughs> There's a new explore page for popular posts. And if you want to put some numbers to it, 887 commits, 23 contribs between June 3rd and March 30th. Good work, team. Yeah. They did a great job with that. And what's also cool is that. That people who have have previously shared the post get notified about any of the edits and changes, which is really forward thinking. I'm I'm hoping Twitter's will be th- that good, but it may not be. <laughs> Twitter editing features. <laughs> no, I we got a shell. Mass.linuxgamecast.com, where you too can absolutely. <laughs> we have how many? How many Why wow, we have 125 people on there? 31 of them are active. Nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You can even retweet, uh, retweet Jill's post now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I got my uh, security issues taken care of. For a while, I guess you couldn't retweet my toots. So I am sorry about that. Some people were able to, some people weren't, but I got that all fixed. <laughs> I'm glad that's sorted out. Yeah. Uh, that, that's an interesting way to go about uh, adding the edit feature because if you. People will abuse the edit thing. And that, that, uh, personally, yeah. like way back in the day, it might have been like the early days of Facebook when it was the Facebook, or it might have been even back in like MySpace, somewhere around there. I used it for comedic effect with um, like having a fun argument with somebody, and, like legitimately good natured one, not like, aha, we were just having fun. Having that type of argument going back and just changing things so it was completely nonsensical, like humor. <laughs> but having that ability to do it with a tweet or a toot. Which is good because we were talking about it in the pre-show, like ah, maybe a typo, or I forgot the link, or it was the wrong link, or you know, yeah, a list of things can change. But as opposed to like (laughs) going back and doing your own revisionist history, I never said that. See, but having a record, nice touch, Mastodon. Yes, so absolutely, people can look back and be like, ah, (laughs) that that's not what you said. That's not what look right here what you said. Um, Also, here's a pro tip: (laughs) if you ever say anything dumb online, leave it. You'll learn from it. Instead of constantly repeating the same mistake over and over and over. There you go. Uh, What do we have up next? Oh, Thunder Chickens. Thunderbird. Woohoo. So the upcoming Thunderbird 102 will be a major upgrade with many new features and a much more modern UI. And is actually targeted for release on June 28th of this year. And there's so many cool features that are coming that, honestly, we've been really needing to modernize this mail client. Um, There's a new spaces toolbar, which helps you keep a variety of activities separate in the form of icons in the left sidebar, which is a nice, quick, easy access. And um, there's a new, more modern look Um, of the address book, which should help you easily find your contacts and interact with them. And there's initial out-of-the-box support for Matrix, the decentralized chat protocol. That's uh, I'm on Matrix a lot. What's Matrix? So I'm looking forward to <laughs> a decentralized chat protocol. It's like it's like the open source and decentralized version of Discord. <laughs> That's what Matrix is like. <laughs> So I'm looking forward to that. It could be uh, Thunderbird could be a great matrix or element client. And one of my 
actual favorite new fe- favorite uh <laughs> my f- <laughs> excuse me for saying favorite yes <laughs> so one of my the new features i really love is a new link preview card for when you add a link in the email composer you can choose to convert it into rich link preview so you see a little preview of the website, or a YouTube video. And that's a really nice feature that other modern email clients have. So it's just, it's really nice what Thunderbird, what they're doing is just making it more modern and bringing in those features that we're used to with our other email clients. Mm. So that's really nice. And, um, you know, I've actually been using Thunderbird since the early years of Firefox when it was included as part of the Firefox suite. And I'm, I think Ven has been too <laughs> for That's a very good long time. That's communicator, baby. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that was the thing, man. Remember the big yeah. 4.0? Oh, gosh. Yes. Everything was <laughs> that was That was a fight, too. It was IE4, Netscape 4, and we had the community. Yeah. But, I mean, that was... Uh, what, a native WYSIWYG HTML editor on Linux that came in that Netscape communicator package. I don't even remember what it was called. It was like pages or whatever it was called. Um, yeah. Pages. Yeah. Oh, and that, and that works. Uh, actually that is still being updated with SeaMonkey, uh, mm. the SeaMonkey uh, web browser suite. Um, and that works really well actually to do web pages. It was around that time, <laughs> somebody had the bright idea to invent CSS and I'm like, Nope, I'm out of this uh, business. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah now, uh, so yeah yeah there there's a there's a lot more new features coming to thunderbird thunderbird uh one point one zero two so make sure to check our show notes and thank you to our theron and chat for bringing this to our attention <laughs> couple of things with thunderbird i no longer use thunderbird because I, it was the one application on this box that took too long to launch First world mm. problem, I know. But when when you're sitting with a thread ripper and NVMe drive and just a tweak that system, <laughs> yeah, you click on slow. something, Aww. you got time to go. Did, did I misclick? Oh, then it would pop up. What did I go to? Mm. I, went, I, I went over to evolution. I didn't go over to anything fun. But I always, I always peek back in and yeah, see if they got a startup Hopefully. time. I, it, it sounds like that they're, they're going to really focus also on uh, speed and as, as well and performance. So that'll be very cool. Maybe. The faster, the better. And, you know, <laughs> in Thunderbird and Evolution's defense, I have like worst case, I have the 13 email accounts that are organized by folders. That yeah, are, uh, like, that yeah. is a thing. So. <laughs> Keep it yeah, I have a couple mind. email accounts on Thunderbird, including my Linux Gamecast account. I've always used mm-hmm. it. And like that has been <laughs> one of the first things, you know, Thunderbird standalone. It was Thunderbird Firefox, Thunderbird up until like maybe two years ago. Just to just get too slow for me. But I always peek back at, oh, and another thing. Okay. Maybe they fix this. I'm going to go look after the show with, um, mm-hmm. because high DPI scaling, you know, it's 2022. I can tell you in 2021. Uh, you would open that on UHD monitor and it just couldn't, how do you fix it? Well, you effectively yeah. have to go into the about config and disable the thing and manually type mm. in it. I'm like we, we, you don't need to be doing that in 2021, much less 20. Hopefully that's fixed. Maybe it is, but, Oh, I remember what it was. See, it's coming back to me now. I'm not pooing on anybody working on Thunderbird. I'm just real user experience because I got the high DPI thing working or they might've added something but it made all the mm-hmm. icons and stuff on the left side. Like they were too big for, um, Oh yeah. The, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And it was <laughs> a, enough of a problem to where there was a plugin in the Thunderbird store to fix that. After yeah, you did that one I fix. That. like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Let's just get something that works. So there we are. All right. Mm-hmm. Something I do is for the video watchers, if listening to the audio, maybe you want to go look in the video. There are two things over here. Now you can see the little circle. That's my jog wheel. That's one of the devices I use to control the DAW, Digital Audio Workstation, this thing that's blanket over here. And to the right of it, there's another unit with some motorized faders and some push buttons and some encoders. I gotta have both of these up and running to do the show live because I gotta be able to track stuff with Mackie. I gotta be able to scrub through 
start, stop, transport, and all that. But I need the other one to adjust the fader so I can tap mute buttons, adjust levels. And this is one of the reasons I've used traditionally Audor and Harrison Mixbus because, you know, you have Audor. Mixbus is Audor with a skeuomorphic body kit on it. But one thing Audor gets just so well is MIDI Learn. And that's where I can take, you know, a controller, and it could be a keyboard. I could do it with, uh, you know, any type of MIDI device and say, hey, this button on the screen, when I press that, okay, I want to press this button on this controller and it's going to press that button. Or if I move this slider up, it's going to move this down with a fader. However you want to do it, however, and you can do inside like plug-in controls and all that. Reaper's always had a problem with that. Now it's good with Mackie mode. This I don't want to get too deep mm -hmm. in the weeds. You got two modes. Well, you got a bunch of modes. Two modes that I use: Mackie mode and MIDI CC. Mackie mode is kind of a predefined map for the controller. So you plug a controller and it's got a bunch of bun buttons, jog wheels, and all that. You say this is a Mackie device, and that's it. But you can't change anything of the predefined everything in there. You can't move it around. You can't shuffle. It's like, well, I want this button to do this, or I want this fader to move this. Mm -mm. That's not how that works. That's where MIDI CC comes in. MIDI CC is just a blank slate. You can just get all your coders, your buttons, your faders, and teach it. Reaper mm. was good with the Mackie stuff. The teaching it with the MIDI CC stuff, it wasn't so great with, especially with motorized faders. It didn't know what to do with it. Uh. Finally came across something that I want to tell everyone about. Called Relearn. What is Relearn? Man, it... it Solved all my problems. That's exactly what and this is relearn squared, I guess it is. It's a VST plugin, instrument plugin for your DAW, and it works with Reaper only. I like how they say that. I'm like, okay, just in case, don't try to use this with something else. I guess somebody did. Controller presets, uh, conditional activations, projections, anything you can throw at it. And it is wicked simple to set up, easy to use. That might look like moon glyphs to you, but if you've ever dealt with MIDI, you're like, oh, I get this. I understand what's going on there. And uh, it's available through Repack, which here's something my Linux brothers and sisters will appreciate. Reaper, the DAW itself, effectively has its own app repository built into the DAW. So you, nice. You can search things mm -hmm. like, oh, and you can add new repos, like your app, you know, sources.list. You're like, hey, this person's got a repo. Oh, I'm put that in there. Let's scan that. Hey, now I have this other new stuff. Yeah. Very happy to see that, and uh, it works very well. I haven't had a problem with it. I had it's simple enough where I could figure it out how to switch things from toggle on, off, and just a cool piece of software. Jill, I was happy to play with it, and I'm using it. Oh, it's nice. It's free, so yeah, go play with it if you are looking for something mm. a bit more advanced than you're out of the box. And I know I'm talking like maybe three people. Control surfaces are uh, mm. pretty much reduced to like. Pro pro mixing or like live content production. So there you go. You got options. Jill, tell me how to install Windows 10. What's the best way to do it? Oh boy. On a uh, <laughs> US from a USB flash drive. Mm. <laughs> Incorrect. Yeah. Incorrect. It is 3.5 <laughs> floppy disk. All hundred. Yes. Oh, oh man. yeah. Okay. 25. How many? Uh, uh, yeah. How many floppy disks for Windows? And I know Windows ninety five was over a hundred because we did it as a project lab because we'd run out of stuff. Yeah, to do that's it, true. Um, secondary school. Yeah. What's your guess? All right, everyone at home, no cheating. What's your guess? How many um, floppies for uh, okay. Windows ten? I want. Look at the camera. Oh look, my gosh! Look at the camera, Jill. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want anybody cheating. I don't want anybody looking at chat. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say just under three hundred. Okay, yeah. Um, I I, re I remember seeing all the floppies. I don't have the floppies <laughs> for Windows ten, but I do have the floppies from Windows seven. <laughs> How many floppies? Let's see if we can even find this. Uh, um, let me get. Let me guess. Uh. Okay, on a CD, let's see, a DVD, four point, uh, the Microsoft DVDs are bigger than, than the standard DVD. <laughs> they compress their data on them. So, let's say, eh, nah, 
I, I say some of it probably they not everything's on the floppies that you you have to use the internet after you install the floppies. So six hundred. Six hundred. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I think we might be off by a factor of um, two thousand. Ah, uh, okay. So it is actually the full DVD. Okay. This one of 2,639, if this is, that looks like a legit photo, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because I think, I think seven was, yeah, 500, I believe. I, I have a set of them <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and I have my Windows 3.1 ones. <laughs> I've, that was good. That was nothing when you think about it nowadays, Yeah, right? those were like, only yeah. about six. Yeah, for work groups. The, um... <laughs> I remember doing that. It was in like secondary school. We it, it was over a hundred because they had sent it yeah. um, to the school. You know, it was just like a backup or whatever. You know, the rest of it was on a compact disc. But we did it, and it took an afternoon. And all the disc read. I bet all those discs probably still read today, man. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, <laughs> yeah, nah, nah, it was it was boring. We would sit and talk for an hour and spot like we were just playing human caddy. Yeah, just yeah. playing. That that's all we did all right um <laughs> right why are we talking about windows 10 let me bring this up yes i had to install windows 10 i needed a copy of windows 10 and i have one windows 10 device a window yes wait yes it is windows 10 uh it is a tablet it is a quad core intel Batrel, like eight inch tablet hmm. it is a miserable evil little device <laughs> that barely worked then and it's got a full-size usb port on it though Used to use this thing for updating our iTunes, and that was the only way. There's no way to, back in the day to edit your iTunes for the podcast uh, outside of Windows. So, and it just lived in a box. I'm like, I have a use for this thing, and I dug it up, and it doesn't even cut on anymore. I'm like, oh, no, I don't care. But that still left mm-hmm. me with an issue because I had a piece of hardware that I had to test. Hmm. I just assumed, you know, 100%. I was like, hey, it doesn't work with Linux, but before sending it back, I wanted to make sure it wasn't like some weird Linux quirk, but you yeah. know, I, I was looking at D message. It wasn't able to get a setup address, much less accept one. I'm like, this is something wrong with the USB controller on this thing more than likely, but I wanted to, you know, cross my T's dot my lowercase J's on this and, um, spend an evening did some Googling. Hmm. Like, cause this is not something I've ever done. How do you make a windows? T- I assumed, okay. I had to start here. I'm like, I assume you can make a thumb drive with windows 10 on it. To install it. Yeah, Microsoft does provide one on their website. I have used that. And um, yeah. I want to do it from Linux, and I found some guides, and I went yeah. through them, and it wasn't working, wasn't working, couldn't someone, I was like, well, I don't know, man, it's like, there's something <laughs> wrong. Finally, I got to this. This is the whole point of the story. Woohoo! Whoa, USB-NG, a simple tool to enable you to create your own USB stick installer from an ISO image, or real DVD, not fake DVDs. Uh, it's a it's a rewrite of the original Woe USB. This, ladies and gentlemen, mm-hmm. was the one application. I also confirmed this with Pedro Saturday because I brought it up and like, because Pedro went through the entire journey as well. I'm trying to save everyone else at home if you're ever in this horrible situation. This is the one <laughs> yeah. piece of Linux software <laughs> that will make a bootable Windows installer from the DVD image that that's all there is to it. It's even got a GUI if you want to rock and roll with that source code. I mean, it's completely open source. Now, it's still got a little nasty bug. It's still got a little nasty bug. Um, when it's doing the grub install on the thumb drive, it's, mm. this is a known bug since 2019. It's still open on the GitHub page. It can take anywhere from two minutes, maybe an hour for it to finish that, depending. Oh, wow. Okay. So not something I would recommend being in a hurry to do. And that's exactly what I did after, because it froze. One would assume, right? It's sitting on that. It's like installing grub. It's been like 10 minutes. What's going on? You know, I can go to Google and (laughs) go to the GitHub search. And like, is it like, ah, there's an entire thread on this from 2019. That's still up to date. So it hasn't been closed. And the solution is just waited out. That's what I did. I went and got a shower. Came back, it was done, but it didn't. Moral of the story, I have a hard drive not connected inside of Jill's computer right now with a functioning copy. 
air quotes, functioning copy of Windows 10. Ah, nice. Oh, <laughs> which it was fun. That's Jill, awesome, Ben. Because <laughs> do, do you know do you know uh, how Windows 10 recognized the uh, fiber optics, the fiber card? Oh, inside yeah. This box? Tell tell me that story. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it's short. It didn't. It didn't. Okay. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> the end. And they all lived happily yeah. ever after. Wow. Yeah, I, I had to go into the BIOS and enable the, the copper thing, go get some cable and roll. Oh my goodness yeah, gracious. Yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, that, oh, that's what I was, I promised you. Then I went to shut it down. Do you know what Windows does when you go to shut it down? It's like, uh-uh. It just is like, wait. I'm like, wait for what? 40 plus minutes. Then I'll let you shut down. Why? <laughs> Shrug emoji. <laughs> How do you yeah. people deal with this? And plus, I don't know how to navigate anything on Windows 10. I think you were listening Saturday. I was asking um, Pedro uh-huh. since he works with Windows. Like, how do you find applications in Windows 10? So we just type the name. What if you don't know the name of them? Yeah. Yeah. Just like people complain about using applications on Linux. It's like, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. In my, my, my attempt to empathize with my brothers and sisters, if that's how you feel about Linux, I get it then. Okay, because it's like, I'm, mm-mm, I have no intention to learn any of this. Bye. But I'm not going to blame Windows 10 for it. It gets enough hate because there's Windows 11. And there's, yeah. You can hate on that now. Um, hey, if you <laughs> like to help us out and you like what we do, we do this every Wednesday and we do a bunch of stuff. You know, we stream on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, all the days except for Mondays, I think. And that's it. Wait, Sundays. Aha, I knew there were two days. Uh, we got some yeah. bonus stuff. People can help us out. <laughs> Patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. Or if you just want to share the show, that'd be brilliant. I very much appreciate it. But if you come to Patreon, we mm-hmm. got some extra things like the live and uncut series of this show. You know, we hear us talking about the pre-show. There's also a post-show. You get a nice little MP3 customized RSS feed or if you just want to download that. Plus the video version of the live and uncut, which is kind of nice to have. And, uh, we got some bonus things, access to our Discord. That's where we hang out the other, all the, we're mm-hmm. just in there constantly. I mean, the, every day of the week. <laughs> yeah. That's our group Slack. It's uh, Slack with our hundred of our closest friends that are just in there. Yeah. We're, we're talking back and forth. A <laughs> couple of channels. That's how we do the audio and stuff for the uh, Trek Mania things and the after shows and on Saturday where we get together and play some games. One well, no, other's not. You get your name in the credits, you can buy a shirt. That's the thing. Somebody bought a shirt last yeah, week. Yeah, you Jill. can. Oh, good. Which one? <laughs> it was the face shirt. Uh, the me, Jordan, and oh, uh, okay. Yeah, like the one the LGC I, the, boys. Yeah, the one I wouldn't wear. <laughs> I'm like, I couldn't wear a shirt with my face on. It. Uh, <laughs> I like, mm-hmm. So I want to thank everyone um, who's helped us out. It's kind of brilliant, and uh, yeah, we just yeah. get to the. It lets us do the show that you want to do. We don't ever have to worry about anything. It's like you want to talk about this? Yeah. All right. Let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have uh, uh, several people who increase their pledges on Patreon. One is David. And then we have Zeno, who increased his pledge as well. And we have a new patron named Anjun. Thank you so much. Thank you for supporting Linux Gamecast and all that we do. We do work hard five days a week. <laughs> Anjun. Oh, well, I'll have you know, Jill, that's pronounced Samuel. It's not. I just made that Sam? up, Jill. Don't put any thought into it. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've heard the the name Anjun before, so <laughs> we were talking about that. Uh, but yeah, at the beginning of the show, that's one of my. Here's a simple mm-hmm. streamer trick that I picked up over the last decade. Is you know some people still mm-hmm. get like their hacker lead names. We're all guilty of it. Don't. Don't for one second be like, I would say yeah, you did. You know you did at some point. And uh, some people still <laughs> like the hacker leap names with the lead speaks and stuff. And they all have different pronunciations. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, here's what I do. I was like, oh, you just read it out as it is numerically. One, three, four, H, eight, T, R, what? All right. So and just call them by that two or three times. Then you'll get a broken down explanation of what you're supposed to Like, ah, yeah. now I see what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Life hacks. All right, we got a slice of pie. Woohoo. Mm. Oh boy, that that looks like a cake, not a pie. It looks like a it's cake a, with It's the same thing. It's Lock. supposed to be a keyboard. It's supposed to be <laughs> ZX Spectrum. A Specky. Yes. It's a delicious ZX Spectrum. 
Mm, <laughs> so tasty. And listen, I personally, you should never say anything because I mean, that thing looks like it survived the plague. So yeah, it does. This, this one isn't, <laughs> that wasn't very artistically done. <laughs> they got the right colors and everything. And it's just, just isn't right. <laughs> it's a little deformed. <laughs> so I didn't know what it was at first. Better than I could do. <laughs> <laughs> that's always my first thought before i knock in anybody's baking man i'm like i couldn't do that yeah <laughs> so, all right reason we're talking about speckies the zx is, is somebody has decided to shove it inside of a raspberry pi i know i know you're thinking to yourself mm-hmm. man did i really need to know that i think you needed to know that jill thinks you needed yeah, to know that and our theory absolutely in chat right now, one of our beautiful yes. patients dropped that in a show suggestions in our Discord. Look at all these plugs. And here it is. <laughs> Unfortunately, it does it's not beautiful. transform into a dinosaur. So I'm a little sad. But <laughs> you know what? You know what? You're looking at the tape right there. It's nice and shiny on the front. That's not for show. That's a legitimate heat sink. Dude had to put on it to keep it from nice. melting so we could get it to boot in a little over 16 seconds but yeah this comes from magpie.raspberrypie.com they do things like this all mm-hmm. the time and uh yeah this is effectively shoving a pi zero w into a cassette case which is kind of neat yeah, that's kind of beautiful fun. 16 <laughs> seconds later it beats uh fuse that's running it which is the specy emulator after what we were just talking about attaching that chunky heat sink which looks the part And I I love this because this keeps in the proud tradition of haphazard tinkerers with just a little bit of electronics experience, making fun things. And, you know, the the electronic to Durkin is (laughs) tradition. I'm like, how can I shove a thing into that? Hmm. You know, if you're looking like old TVs and, but look, it's got a nice little uh, composite video out and mini USB. There it is. Look at the little pipe, the zero W hanging out. Inside a cassette Aww. tape that, again, I must point out, does not transform into a dinosaur. No. <laughs> that would work nicely for my Timex Sinclair, hmm. <laughs> which is the U.S. cousin of the uh, Specky. <laughs> and what was cool is the, the developer said that, you know, his next challenge is going to be a 1980s boombox with uh, dropping cassettes that boot up and play games from different iconic home computers. <laughs> I think that just was so cool. But will it turn into a dinosaur? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, no, it probably won't transform either. The boombox, actually, there is a possibility that the boombox, he, he could do that with his boombox. <laughs> we could call him Soundwave. All right. Yeah. Speed of ways of we got to bounce out of here. Thanks for hanging out with us, and we'll be back next week. But until then, enjoy <laughs> some beautiful symphonic music while we roll some credits. Yeah! Yay! We love all our patrons! We have so many of them in chat right now. We have Artharin, Inertia, Steve Husband, Justin. I want to thank all our executive producers Drummer, Kako, Pabble, Chicago, Ooh. Darkwing, Abstraction. <laughs> Rock it in with that. Who yes. else? We got Sea Monsters from Null, Veritanuda, Justin, Frosty, Strider, Huggy, and David. Death mm-hmm. Notes, Dodger, Cheesy Bacon, Jory, Benjamin, Doom 2. Dot, Wad. I'm doing best I can. <laughs> Linux <much>. New. Ajad, <laughs> minus nine. Phil, Yannick. Episode 321. See, I can read that. It's nice and slow. Yeah. <laughs> We've got Katana Steel. We've got Mr. Alert. Cinemetro. See you next week. (laughs) Love you all. (laughs) 